Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. I've entitled our message for today, Impossible with Zacchaeus. Impossible with Zacchaeus. Let us pray. Father God, we humble ourselves before you at this time. We have read the word once. And we shall read it again. We need your inspiration, your direction, your guidance. May the word be used to transform us by the power of your spirit. And we thank you for doing so. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. What did he do? For the Lord, he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed his way, who looked up? Jesus. And what did he say? Zacchaeus, you come down. For I'm going to your house today. Very interesting story. A very meaningful story. Jesus wants to visit Zacchaeus' home. When reading scripture, we can often pass over some very important details that the gospel writers intended for us to understand. I want us to make sure that we understand Zacchaeus' story, the impossible with Zacchaeus. So for a few moments, we're going to go back. The text has been made clear, and we're going to look at the pretext before and seek to understand it. In Luke 18 and verse 18, we find Jesus interacting with a certain ruler. And Zacchaeus was a ruler also, but this is in chapter 18. That ruler asked Jesus a question, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Here we find an interestingly righteous man asking Jesus a very important question. Jesus engages him by speaking about the law, that he was obviously very familiar with. Because the man answers, All these things have I kept from my youth up. But when it came to selling everything and following Jesus, giving up the God of riches that he served, the ruler could not. So Jesus responds with amazement. How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And some people say it's an actual needle. But we understood from other discussions and the writings of Ellen White that it was one of the gates in the wall of the city that was called a needle. And that the camel had to go really under in terms of getting in there. And it was almost impossible. So the man was puzzled. And so were Jesus' listeners who heard what Jesus said about the impossibility of a rich man entering the kingdom. 
And so they said among themselves, Who then can be saved? If this man who kept the law cannot enter. And then Jesus replies, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. That's why we've entitled the message Impossible with Zacchaeus. So Luke introduced the theme of impossibility previously in Luke 1, going all the way back to the first chapter of Luke, where the angel announced to Mary that she will give birth to Jesus. Mary asked, how can these things be? The angel replies, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. That is the theme that surrounds Jesus' ministry to the lost. The lost cannot save themselves, but with God, nothing shall be impossible. That is the theme that we're looking at today. The lost cannot save, the lost cannot initiate, the lost cannot bring to pass, for nothing they do can save themselves. So we find Jesus comes near to Jericho. We find him healing a blind man who cried out for mercy. On that occasion, the impossible became possible. The blind man could see. But in chapter 19 that we read for our scripture reading, verse 1, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Suspense hang thickly in the air. What will Jesus do now? Verse 2 introduces us to Zacchaeus. It says, And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. And he was what? Very rich. In the space of 30 verses, we are introduced to two rich men and also to Jesus teaching about the rich entering the kingdom of heaven. Jesus' interaction with the rich young ruler demonstrates the impossibility of entering into the kingdom of God because of his attachment to riches. That's the rich young ruler. But now Jesus passes through Jericho and he finds another rich man, Zacchaeus. With the impossible, he made it possible. Praise God. Our message today, look at the utter impossibility of salvation from Zacchaeus' standpoint, and then at how salvation is made possible from Jesus' side. Praise the Lord. Imagine for a moment the eye of a needle. Imagine the farmer or the wayfaring traveler seeking at sunset trying to get his camel through the gate because the major door is closed and he could not get through. It's a, it's a huge animal. A grown camel is about seven feet tall at the hump. And Jesus is saying, and Zacchaeus knew the story well, many have tried and failed to the injury of both the, the gate and the animal. Now Jesus says that it is easier, easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So is there hope for Zacchaeus? Why does Jesus speak that way? Because he wants us to understand the utter impossibility of entering the kingdom of God if we worship anything besides God. It is not just the rich, though they are vulnerable to many temptations, 
about having money. This is evidenced by the rich young ruler, but in our fallen state, it is impossible for anyone to fit into the narrow entrance into the kingdom of God. And that is how we meet Zacchaeus today, seeking, curiously, wanting to know more about how he can enter into the kingdom of God. But at that particular time, standing outside the kingdom in all its impossibilities. From the point of view and from what Jesus had just said about camels and rich men, it is impossible for Zacchaeus to enter into the kingdom of God. Everything is against him. Number one, his station. He's a publican. His station is against him. Verse 2 says what? Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief. He was of the highest position in his career. Chief among the publicans. The irony of the man's name is not lost. The meaning of, Zachary, of Zacchaeus is the righteous one. And he was the chief tax collector, so he was the righteous chief. How can these two things go together? Tax collectors were despised in Israel. They were Jews, but they collected tax for the Romans. And to add insult to injury, they made money off the backs of their fellow Jews by asking for more taxed money than was necessary and keeping the excess for themselves. Impossible, according to his station. He was a thief and a robber. So this extortion, this robbery, this thievery, did not gain the publicans any favor with their fellow Jews. They were despised. They were hated. And now we read that Zacchaeus is the chief. So he's their boss. No doubt he would have made even more money than a regular tax collector. He was the chief. So he could make money not only on the people he collected taxes from, but also from the tax collectors under his authority. Thus, he was despised even more by his fellow Jews. He was written off by the Pharisees as irredeemable, hence impossible with Zacchaeus. It is impossible for Zacchaeus to be saved. Irredeemable, lost, thief. But that was only one of Zachary's impossibility, his station in life. Another one was his substance, riches. His substance was against him as far as Jesus made statement. In verse 2 we read, And he was rich. So number one, his position and station in life was against him. Number two, his substance or riches was against him. He had amassed a considerable amount of fortune because of his dishonest collecting of taxes. Remember now Jesus' words regarding rich men entering into the kingdom? For it is impossible, it is more likely that a camel will go through the needle's eye than a rich man so number two impossibility, Zachary, Zacharias was rich. How hardly shall they have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. He had set his heart on riches, which proves a great kept back or hindrance to enter into the kingdom of God. So number two, it is impossible for Zacchaeus to be saved. One, his station in life. Two, 
his substance in life. Number three, Zacchaeus' stature is against him. He wants to see Jesus, but he cannot because he's too short. The Bible says, and he sought to see Jesus who he was and could not for the press because he was a little stature. And he ran before, climbed up in a sycamore tree to see him. For he, Jesus, was to pass that way. Verse 3 and 4. There is curiosity in Zacchaeus' mind. I wonder who Jesus is. Mrs. White says Zac Zacchaeus heard about Jesus before that day. Other publicans have told him the stories about this Jewish itinerant preacher who forgives sinners and publicans alike. And Zacchaeus wanted to know if he has a chance. But three things we have read already are against him. His statue is against him. His substance is against him. His position is against him. But Zacchaeus pressed on. This drives him to climb into a tree in order to see who Jesus was. He's physically limited from seeing Jesus. So, it is impossible for Zacchaeus to meet Jesus and be saved. There are other impediments or hindrances to Zacchaeus. The spectators are against him. When Jesus addressed Zacchaeus and told him he was going to stay at his house, the spectators began to grumble. And when they saw it, verse 7, and they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is not a publican, but a what? A sinner. Sin so it's synonymous. If you're a publican, you're a sinner. If you're a sinner, you're a publican. And if you're a sinner, you're a thief, and it's impossible for you to make it. They all murmured. The same word is used when the publicans and sinners came to hear Jesus in Luke 15, where he speaks to them the parables of the missing sheep, coin, and the prodigal son. The Pharisees murmured then, and they murmured now. A rumble of discontentment ripples through the crowd, as they witnessed Jesus and Zacchaeus enter into the tax collector's house. Zacchaeus is a thief. Jesus may not be the Messiah after all, for if he had only known who this man is, he would not even invite himself to go into the house. So the Pharisees think that Zacchaeus is not worthy of Jesus' presence. They murmured against it. Rather than rejoicing and encouraging Zacchaeus, they murmured and are against him. Thus, it is impossible for Zacchaeus to be saved. The spectators murmured. His substance was against him. His stature in life was against him. So Zacchaeus could not make it. And then, Zacchaeus' sins are against him. More than anything, this makes salvation impossible for him. This man whose name, as I said before, actually means righteous, is anything but righteous. His spectators rightly labeled him a sinner. However graceless their attitude is, the fact that he eventually gives his money to the poor and pays back those whom he defrauded indicates sin in Zacchaeus' life needed to be dealt with. He's a thief and a fraud, defrauding many for his own millions. This man Zacchaeus is a sinner, and because of that, it is impossible for him to be saved. Everything is against Zacchaeus, making it utterly impossible for him to be saved. 
What makes it impossible for us to be saved this morning? Is it your station in life? Is it your station that is exalted above that position you have before God? Are you unemployed or a CEO or self-employed? The rich are particularly vulnerable because riches make almost everything in life possible. But the absence of riches can make us murmur and complain and think that it is impossible. Are you physically or mentally hindered from being saved? Or do you use the excuse of your spiritual inability? And there are people in your life who are making it impossible. Are there people in your life who are making it impossible for you to be saved? Are your sins against you, hindering you from being saved? What this morning or this afternoon are your impossibilities? We know that of Zacchaeus. Through the passage of scripture, we are counseled by the word of God to take our eyes off everything that we would turn for salvation to the master of everything. Our position in life, our substance, our lack thereof, our physical or mental emotional limitations, the spectators in our lives, our sins, our excuses, all these things may be against us. But remember, brethren, saints of God, the words of Jesus, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. It would have been easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for Zacchaeus to be saved. But we read that Jesus came to Jericho Jesus comes wherever you are. Jesus comes to Belleville Heights, to Belleville. Jesus comes to Romulus, to Taylor, to Ypsilanti, to Ann Arbor, to Michigan, to all 48 contiguous states of the United States. He goes to Alaska. He goes to Europe. He goes to Africa and Asia, Australia, Antarctica, and the Arctic Circle. Everywhere that mankind dwells. Jesus goes there and he finds us all these things that make salvation impossible. Every cause that you can muster, every roadblock thrown up in your God's path, God takes away and destroys them, hallelujah. And he says, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. That's what Jesus displays as he comes to Jericho. He makes the impossible possible. He brings salvation to the house of a publican, a sinner, a thief, a fraud. He himself says in verse 10, for the Son of Man is come to do what? Look at verse 10. How? So we look at the impossibility of Zacchaeus. Let's look at the possibility of Jesus. The Savior always shows up. He showed up in my life, and he keeps on showing up in my life. Every shortcoming, he shows up and says, I can take care of that. Every indecency, he shows up and says, Winston, I can take care of that. Every sin, he shows up and says, I want to be with you. I can take care of that. Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. This is no more coincidence. He comes to the city whose builder was cursed and his son died and brings the great blessing of life to the house of Zacchaeus. There is intentionality in Jesus' action as he comes through Jericho to meet with Zacchaeus. Ellen White says also that Jesus knew about that event 
A long time ago, even in all eternity, Jesus knew that that day would come. And who knows today that Jesus knows this day would come. And perhaps someone who has been bordering around and around the cross, but never standing still to face Jesus on the cross, would be encountered by Jesus today. Scripture tells us, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. Jesus is coming to make the impossible possible. He's going to usher a rich man into the kingdom of God. That is a possibility. He's going to make Zacchaeus truly a righteous man. So the Savior shows up, and he continues to show up. Secondly, the Savior sees. News travels that Jesus is coming. So Zacchaeus wants to see him and quickly climbs the tree to see who Jesus is. Christ not only shows up, but he make, takes immediate stock of the situation. He has seen Zacchaeus from all eternity, as I said before. He knows exactly where he is. In verse 5, we read, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus, but we don't read that he actually saw Jesus because Jesus saw him first. And when we are seeking Jesus, Jesus has already seen us first. And according to the gospel, Jesus has given to each man a measure of faith that we can be awakened to follow him when he calls us. So Jesus called, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house today. What a blessing that Jesus looks up with tender mercy upon each one of us today. He sees us where we are. He sees us as sinners. He sees the impossibility of Zacchaeus' situation. He sees our impossibility and says, Winston, I die for you. Church, I died for you. This little man is up in the tree because he couldn't see above his head. The pursuit of wealth was his besetting sin. And that makes it impossible to enter the kingdom. But when Jesus takes notice of sinners, hallelujah, when he sees the ungodly, he sees them to save them. He sees the things which are impossible and he makes them possible so that sinners can be saved as they confess their sin. So the Savior does not only shows up or sees us. The Savior speaks to us. Jesus not only show up, he sees Zacchaeus in the tree, but he begins to speak things up by speaking first. And God always speaks first to our mind and consciences. Zacchaeus, he called him my name. Imagine that. Jesus, the sinless one, saying to Zacchaeus, Oh, Righteous one, because that's what the name means. Yeah. Come down. I'm going to your house today. Jesus speaks. Do you sense the irony? A sinner up in a tree whose name means righteous one, and Jesus dying upon a tree to save all sinners who are lost. Yeah. The only righteous one, Jesus who would become sin for us. He comes and he calls Zacchaeus by name. Through the gospel preached to all of us, Jesus is calling our name. And I ask the question today, do you hear him call? Do you hear him call your name? He speaks with authority. He speaks with a divine command. Zacchaeus, come down. I am going, Jesus did not ask for an invitation. And that is interesting. I'm going to your house today. How sweet would be the fellowship when we know that Jesus is in our house. Every day, as we wake up in the morning, as we go to bed at night, Jesus is in our house. 
So he speaks the divine command. And when he does so, sinners take notice. Have you ever heard his commanding voice is the question. Make haste and come down. Jesus is here. Don't delay. He cuts through all the impossibilities with this command. Zacchaeus is not really any difference from the blind man that Jesus had recently healed. Both are incapacitated and both need the command of Jesus to enliven them. And Jesus healed the blind man and visited the home of Zacchaeus. So Jesus also speaks with purpose. He speaks authoritatively, he speaks with command, and he speaks with purpose. The purpose was, today, I am going to your house. I'm going to your house. I invite myself. There is a divine necessity in these words. Was it because Jesus is so hungry and tired from the journey? No, no, no. We have read so many stories about Jesus' interaction with individuals. The woman at the well tells the story that Jesus says, I'm thirsty. And he was genuinely thirsty. But when the disciples came and asked him, Master, here is food, he says, I have meat that you know not of. Because of his interaction with someone who was a sinner that received him as Savior. And here it was, Jesus is going to Zacchaeus' house to eat, yes, but more so to save a soul from death and hell. He was come to save Zacchaeus. He has come to show that the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Zacchaeus, the rich man, will be brought into the kingdom. It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. But when Jesus speaks, a rich man will enter the kingdom at his command. Hallelujah. So nothing is impossible with God. Jesus speaks invitingly. He doesn't ask, Zacchaeus, may I come to your house today? Rather, he says, I must come to your house today. Just as Zacchaeus desired to know who Jesus was, he finds himself face to face with Jesus in a way that he never thought he would see Jesus. He doesn't see him just from a tree, but he will witness him in his own home. And we must not see Jesus afar off, but see him as he enters our heart, as the lover of our soul. He will experience Jesus transforming power in his life. That's the invitation. And then, in that invitation, Jesus does not only speak, but Jesus saves. Jesus shows up, he sees, he speaks, but he also saves. That is the whole purpose of his coming to Jericho, to make the impossible possible. Jesus is in the house. Salvation is offered to everyone. He has come to save Zacchaeus. He has come to save me. Everything was previously against Zacchaeus, and everything may be previously or until this time against you. But now Jesus sees Zacchaeus and speaks with him and saves him. Even so, the Holy Spirit may be speaking to your heart as Jesus sees you and wants to save you. That is true for sinners today whose impossibilities are erased through the power of the Son of God. If God be for us, who can be against us? We see evidence of Jesus at work in his saving grace. In that he saved Zacharias from all his sins. In verse 6 we read, And he made haste, came down and received them joyfully. I like that. He received them joyfully. When all your sins are rolled away, there is joy, unspeakable joy, that comes into your heart. When all my sins are washed away, Joy, eternal joy, 
res resident itself in my heart. When Jesus commands sinners to make room for him in their hearts, they are constrained to obey. Jesus does not force himself on Zacchaeus, but bends his will so that Zacchaeus responds. This is by no means free will or self-help gospel. When the Son of Man enters our lives, <clears throat> we will know it in our response to him. Zacchaeus made haste and came down. He obeyed Jesus' command. That is the best evidence of Jesus' work in our lives. Obedience to the word of God. So you want evidence of your response as Jesus calls. It's because you respond obediently, joyfully, and lovingly. And alongside obedience is another evidence of a newfound faith. That is, <clears throat> Zacchaeus comes face to face with the Savior. This is no chance meeting. This is no small task. This is life and death. And Jesus has just saved this man from certain death. This man was just saved from sin. As a result, he received Jesus with joy into his heart, into his home. He receives Jesus as his Savior. Oftentimes when we visit homes and pray with folks, we pray this statement. May everyone who comes into these dwelling places know that Jesus is a silent guest to all our conversation and an unseen listener to all our conversation. Jesus is not only wanting to be in our hearts, but in our homes. So often we're afraid of using the question, have you received Jesus as your personal savior? And often we must ask ourselves as individuals and one another the same thing. It implies that we are doing something but we always are doing something with Jesus. We either reject Jesus or we receive him. We see the same in Luke's narrative. There are two rich men, as I said before, and they have two different responses to Jesus. The one rejects Jesus, the other receives him. Zacchaeus received Jesus with joy. Here is a sinner receiving Jesus because all the impossibilities have been re removed. And the question goes forth, have you received Jesus? He makes the impossible possible. And if that is enough for Jesus, if that is enough for Zacchaeus, Jesus goes on. He confirms that Zacchaeus is indeed saved through the work that he was about to perform in Jerusalem in his death on the cross. He had taught his disciples about their work earlier, and now we find Zacchaeus believing on Jesus as the one who was to be crucified. This day, Jesus declared, is salvation come to your house. For as much as he is also a son of Abraham, salvation is come to his house. The house of the despised tax collector which now receives the blessing of salvation. Earthly riches have been suspended by riches of heavenly kind. Perishable goods have been replaced by imperishable. A treasure on earth is surpassed by a heavenly treasure. Salvation is come to the home of Zacchaeus. So the question goes forth, where is your heart being drawn? Are you being pulled to Jesus who removes all impossibilities to salvation or toward a counterfeit God who continues to make things impossible for you? This Zacchaeus that we read about was no longer considered a rightful Jew. Is declared a son of Abraham. The Pharisee says that he, re he is irredeemable but Jesus declared that he's a son of Abraham. Jesus demonstrates that a true son of Abraham is not one who necessarily physically descends from the line, but one who lives out the promises made to Abraham that Christ would come.
Here is the man who did the works of Abraham. He repented. He received Jesus. And he now lives by faith in the Son of God. Zacchaeus was disowned by his fellow Jews as a natural son of Abraham. But through Jesus Christ, he's made a true son of Abraham. Even as Jesus confirms the salvation of Zacchaeus, he condemns those who were murmuring about his dining with Zacchaeus. To those who were Jews and who lived uprightly, thinking they were the son of Abraham, Jesus points out the real issue to be the heart and not the outward actions only. Jesus further confirms Zacchaeus' salvation by speaking of his work in saving the lost. He says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Zacchaeus was truly lost, and according to all measurements, it was impossible to be saved. But Jesus made it possible. Yes. What is impossible with man is possible with God. Is there a Zacchaeus who reads this sermon, who hears this sermon, who listens to the sermon? Is there a Zacchaeus male or female? Is there a Zacchaeus Seventh-day Adventist or non-Adventist? Make no mistake, church attendance cannot save us. Make no mistake, eating good food cannot save us. But if we love Jesus, we will attend church. If we love Jesus, we will eat the right food. So is there a Zacchaeus in our house today? He sees you in all your impossibilities. And he calls you to bring that to him. He wants you to acknowledge the impossibility for, from your point of view. He speaks. That's Jesus. He commands. He invites. Make haste and come down. I must come to your house today. He saves. He saves the chief tax collector. He saves the chiefest of sinners among us today. He makes sinners whole. Finally, the Savior sanctifies. Jesus does not only save. He's also the sanctifier. Praise God. Salvation is his fourth in sanctification. That is, in holy living. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord. Verse 8, let's read it. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord what? Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. So the Lord saves and the Lord sanctifies. Zacchaeus' life was changed, transformed. Not tomorrow or next year, but even right there and then, Zacchaeus allowed the power of the Spirit of God to work in his life towards transformation. It says, throughout the course of the conversation with Jesus, Zacchaeus must have been convicted of the chief sin, and now he's responding in obedience to the call of Jesus upon his life. Demonstrating with obedience looks like a transformed and an abiding and a reset life. Promising that he would defraud anyone no more, Zacchaeus says, half of my goods I'll give to the poor. Notice the resolve of Zacchaeus. At first it seems like He's bragging, but no. Zacchaeus has been changed, and the sins that affected him most were the areas where sanctification first evidenced itself. He takes aim at the sin of greed. He takes aim at the sin of riches. Half of his goods are distributed to the poor, and the money he has gained by fraud is returned fourfold to the poor and to the people that he stole it from. This is not superficial. This is an outward lifestyle as a result of an inward working of the Spirit of God. He doesn't just make an empty promise that he will turn his life around and no longer steal. Rather, he makes restitution. 
This is not a case for what some people call socialism where everyone has the same thing. But it is a case that proves that the impossible is made possible with Jesus. And as Jesus ushered a rich man into the kingdom of God, he can usher all of us today. It is not the riches that concern Jesus. These riches are Zacchaeus' idol. For Jesus has made others rich in the past. He made Job rich. He made Abraham rich. He made Jacob rich. But when those riches become an idol, then it is dangerous. It is easier for a camel than for you. You really are lost if you are being drawn away from God by anything besides Jesus. So Jesus is calling us today. Whatever your name is, I want to come to your house today. And Jesus is saying, listen, of a truth, your body is my temple. I want to dwell in you. I want to live in you. I want to walk in you. I want to abide in you. I want to be your God. And I want you to be my son and my daughter. Come and allow me to visit with you today. And according to the text, it will be a joyous occasion. So, in conclusion, was it impossible with Zacchaeus? With man, all things are possible. But with God, everything is possible. May your salvation today be assured because you have invited Jesus to come into your life as he first knocked at your heart door and say, I want to come into your life today. I want to tell Jesus again today, Jesus, I love you for what you've done for me. Jesus, I declare that you are Savior and Lord. And I invite you again to come into my life and take up your residence. How many would like to join me in this decision? Please stand to your feet. Jesus, I open my heart's door and invite you to come in today. With God, nothing, absolutely nothing is impossible. So let us pray. Father God, that which had seemed impossible to Zacchaeus, Jesus passed by, invited him self to his house, and salvation came to his house that day. Even so, as we heard your word, we open our heart's door and invite Jesus to come in. Sanctify us. Baptize us with the spirit of your power or the power of your spirit. Lead us in a path of righteousness for your name's sake. That when you come, it will be possible for us all to be with you forever as your sons and your daughters. Bless us to this end, we pray. And we thank you joyfully in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen.